Welcome to the Bristol, Western Nevada College's Bristol Cone Gallery. We're here with Phyllis Schaefer and her amazing collection of figure studies. Um, so Phyllis, tell us, what do you think of the exhibition? This is so much fun because um, this, these, as I told you before, these were never meant for exhibition. These were studies that were done um, in the process of teaching. And so when I retired last June from Lake Tahoe Community College, I bundled up all this stuff and brought it home and didn't think it would go anywhere. And you and Glenn approached me and um, what a great idea for a show. So, uh, and I especially like the uh, fact that there's a lot of teaching notes alongside the drawings as well. Well, I, I love those. They're, they're like a conversation within each piece, and you can see what you were talking about with the students. Right, right. You can, hear, you can hear your voice, you can hear your comments, and, and uh, they, it really activates them and personalizes the drawings at the same time. Yeah, yeah. thank you. Yeah. Hey, Phyllis, this piece, um, tell us about the skeleton. Okay, so at the beginning of the quarter, we were on the quarter system at Lake Tahoe Community College, um, I always start with the skeletal structure. And I go over what the major bones are, just so that we have some kind of common language when I'm talking with the students. But it also helps them to understand what's going on when we're looking at the live model, because this is the underpinnings, the structure that makes up uh, the human form. So um, I was lucky to have three skeletons in the collection and so we would start out on newsprint and newsprint of course is full of acid, it's not going to last very long and we would use vine charcoal and vine charcoal is like a little burnt up stick and if you've never used it, it, it erases very easily, you can just sort of smear it with your hand and so there's low commitment which is a great way to start for the students. Well, that's good. So, um, on this particular piece, you wrote drawing, sensual, and intellectual, which Chris Lanier, who wrote the essay, um, actually used for the title. So, do you have any additional thoughts about drawing, sensual, and intellectual? Well, you know, when um, Chris asked me about that, I was like, what? I don't have any memory of that, because I'm writing these things in class, as something to remind me that when the students, when we have our next huddle, I'll mention something like this. But um, I think my teaching style tends to be opposites. So I, I create this idea of a spectrum. And on one end of the spectrum is the idea of sensual drawing, is feeling um, when, a, when a model is putting all their weight on one leg, and so you get that contraposto, the pelvis is rising on one side. So it's, the, it's more of a um, feeling or a motive way of approaching the figure. Intellectual would be more the measuring how many heads high is the figure, how long is the humerus, um, all of the measuring that helps you to make the figure look um, accurate. So to me, this is the dichotomy, and we're always swinging somewhere between those two poles. Perfect. As that Chris mentioned in his essay was these um, instructional notes that I'm putting are almost like thought bubbles That's above right. the figure's head, contemplating how they were created. Um, the other thing about drawing on black paper as opposed to dark marks on white paper is that you're kind of pulling the form out of the darkness. And sometimes that white piece of paper can be sort of intimidating. And there's a kind of magic that happens. And I watch the students struggle, and then something tips, and they get it. And they begin to see this form emerging. If they can read the values, they begin to, it's almost sculptural the way it comes out of this dark surface. Perfect. Phyllis. Take us to color here. Oh, so I can never wait until we get to color, which is at the latter part of the, of the um, course. But I always start the students out with um, two blues, a lighter and a darker, plus they're white and black, and then they get these terracotta colors. And you can buy these Conti crayons or, or pastel sticks that are in, I think there's like four different um, oranges in the orange family. 
And of course, if you know anything about color theory, orange and blue sit on opposite sides of the color wheel. So they empower each other. And it's a great way to, so up till now, we're always looking at light and dark and that spectrum that I created with some of the other drawings. Now we're throwing another ball into your juggling act, which is warm and cool. And so on the skin tones, um, I'm asking the students to really look at where is it lighter, um, where is it darker, but also where is it warmer and where is it cooler? And you have warm highlights and cool highlights and warm shadows and cool shadows um, all over the body. And so this is a great way to limit their palette, but get them to add in that, um, that ability to then begin to see warmth and coolness on the skin tones. Phyllis, take, take us into paint, figure painting. Okay, so um, I developed, the, um, after some figure drawing courses, I developed the figure painting courses. And this was a chance to take oils, and the prerequisite was a beginning painting course. So the students that I had already had been indoctrinated into my beginning course, so they had an understanding of how to use oil, um, now applied to the figure. And there's things that you have to think about with the oil. Uh, you don't want pigments that are real high tinting, have a high tinting power. Like, I would never use ultramarine blue. It has a very strong tinting power. You'd end up making her look like she has gangrene or something. Um, so you want to use colors like cobalt blue, which has a, a more um, softer kind of tinting power, meaning when you start to blend it, it's not going to take over. But, um, and again, I would probably start them out with a limited palette. We always start with the grayscale, because light and dark is the first thing. And then, of course, it's always the measuring and, and all that sort of intellectual part of um, the process, and, as well as the sensual. This model, she was very thin, and when she sat, she had this beautiful kind of caved in, curved sort of feeling in her body, um, just really delicious kind of poses. And I think we've talked about like that I, I tend to have a lot of seated poses I do start my course with standing because that's easiest for them to grab onto and to count how many heads high is the body um, in a standing pose. But pretty quickly, especially when you're painting, and this was probably a one session, we'd always start out with one session and that's probably as little as two hours of actual painting. By the time you have your setup and your and my demo and then our, fine, our quick critique at the end in a three hour class, um, you're moving pretty fast. And I think this was a, a secondary triad palette. So it's orange, green, and violet, which is really sympathetic. And it's one of my favorites. As a landscape painter, yes. the secondary triad is just, you know, right up my, uh, right up my alley. So uh, that's where that came from. Of course, you know, you kind of spin out and it hits some of your hotter um, tones in here, but um, secondary triad, you can't beat it. Perfect. Yeah, let's talk about this conversation that these two figures are having. <laughs> so, you know, uh, with my more advanced students, um, they're ready to take on something a little bit more layered or a little bit more advanced. And so the minute that you put this top hat on the model and you pose him next to the skeleton, you've got a narrative. And so that adds to the whole content of the piece. And I think this was a longer, this was a more sustained pose. Um, we used to have a Friday open lab that was three hours long. And this would be the kind of thing that, um, and I would often go in and work with the students on a Friday, even though it wasn't a class. Because one of the things that I realized is, if you don't draw from the model for like a week, you feel it. It's like not going to the gym. Oh. Uh, that constant kind of looking and being able to get that hand-eye coordination, um, you have to really keep your chops up. So those Friday sessions where we could just get into one pose for the whole three hours was so luxurious. Oh, that's great. That's great. Well, uh, the comment was made about backlighting that goes on, on his hair and the bottom of his beard. Yeah, so um, in the studio I have cam lights and I would turn out the big lights so that you got a little bit more specific um, kind of lighting and I had lights on stands so that we could get some kind of dramatic lighting 
from time to time, and um, and I'm always taking the, the the spot that none of the students want. So sometimes I would get um, looking straight into the light source, but you're getting that beautiful backlighting halo around the edge of the figure. Yeah, and this guy was one of my favorite models, a professional dancer, uh -huh. and had done some modeling in San Francisco. And I think back east as well, maybe New York or something. Um, and so he he was always up for making it a little bit more dramatic in, in a sense. Yeah. Well, yeah. There's several drawings of him. Yes. In, in the show. He was one of my favorites. Yeah. Good. Good. Phyllis, I think this is the only piece in the show that's on green paper. So. <laughs> And me, you me. notice it has the waffle weave. Normally, I would probably use the other side, which is a smoother surface, but sometimes it's fun to have that kind of texture of the paper being a part of the drawing. Um, and I think this was also, you know, you, you see bits where the paper is coming through. So again, that warm cool, I'm, I'm adding a lot of warmth on a basically cool tone paper. But um, again, you have your all your um, pastels out, and it's very hard not to want to just lay in that lavender kind of cool shadow, and then blue underneath, and somehow um, the paper is sort of what inspires you to pick up certain colors. Good point. Good point. Phyllis, in Chris's essay, you talked about getting the students to learn to see. Yes, so I think what I said to Chris was if there was any kind of an umbrella concept for my 27 years of teaching, it's to get students to see. And they come in the door and they think they see, but it's a conceptualization. And then what you're trying to do is to get them to separate their brain from their eyes. And I always say, check your brain at the door. We're going to be working out your eyes. And so like in portraiture, which is probably one of the most precise kinds of drawing, I mean, you could change a line a, a 32nd of an inch one way or another, and you lose the look of the model. And that's, uh, after all, kind of what we, were, what we were going for. So in this, it was me demonstrating that there's the front of the face and the side of the face, and even turning the head into kind of a cube so that they get more dimensionality. Um, and I think probably like trying to get them to not use line because that really flattens it, but to see the nose as this triangular form that has a ridge where usually the highlight is the strongest and shadows. So um, all of these things are just strategies, teaching strategies for getting the students to see. So Phyllis, talk to us more. Many of the, of the drawings in here are models are seated or fewer lying down as opposed to the, like we said, the classic Greek stiff standing poses. Right, right. So talk about seated models or positions that you requested. Well, probably the re one of the reasons that we don't have as many standing poses is because they're, those are usually done on newsprint and they are just they go away, they tear, they, if you look at them wrong, the, the fine charcoal goes away. So this is a little bit deeper into the course. And what I like is, I think I do like the seated poses because the way someone sits says a lot about them. The attitude of their shoulders, what they do with their arms, and I'm always trying to get them to just relax. And I can feel when the model's in pain. And so a lot of the standing poses are really painful. Like you think we're standing here with, my, I've got my weight on my left uh, leg right now. If I stood here for 20 minutes, I'd be screaming. Yeah. So the seated pose just made it more comfortable. And um, I don't know, I, there's something emotionally about the relaxed sort of poses that interested me. And this, this particular one is, mid-tone paper using the, the lightest light that you can with your white charcoal, then getting it darker, and then using the paper as one of your values, and then switching to the black charcoal and taking it all the way to the blackest black. So there's the spectrum there with the paper at about a, what, 30% gray. And then we introduce the terracotta um, reddish browns into this. So this is our way of, 
leaving, um, still continuing to work with black and white, but then beginning to introduce the idea of that temperature through the use of these uh, terracotta colors. Well, it's beautiful. And yes, the thought bubble above the model is, <laughs> is great. Phyllis, as a teacher, how did you get your students to um, lead them away from copying your work? From doing your styles and guide them into discovering their own voices? Well, I think um, it's a combination of things. It's that I was teaching at a community college, which is the first two years of the undergraduate education. And so it's really about foundation. And so rather than getting them to mimic my style, I was teaching foundational concepts. And I was, at the same time that I was giving them a lot of uh, information in terms of foundation and and how to manipulate things and how to see, I was also always bringing up what I saw in their work. So it's kind of like I'm the shrink, they're on the couch, they're just telling their story and I'm seeing patterns of behavior that I play back to them and help them to go, oh, I always do this. And I said, you're, you're basically a detective and you're looking for who you are as an artist. Meanwhile, you're polishing and, and adding more tools to your toolbox, but at the same time, you're always on the lookout for what is your vision, what is your um, content, what's uniquely you. Uh, I just would not want to have a bunch of little, um, you know, imitators of my style. And you know, my students, Many of them have way more talent than I do. Oh, I, I don't know. <laughs> no, I think um, talent is one thing, but um, passion and a work ethic is what gets you home. Mm -hmm. So that's the thing that wasn't always teamed up with the with the natural talent. <laughs> yeah, good point. Okay, Chris Lanier. We commissioned Chris Lanier to write um, the exhibition essay, and it's very insightful, a beautifully done essay. Um, so do you want to talk about the discussion with Chris? I just have to say this was, uh, this was, this is worth its weight in gold. I mean, for an artist to have someone as um, intelligent and perceptive and so talented at writing as Chris to write this after doing our interview is such a gift. Um, and what's so great is that he took the figure, my teaching, and my landscape paintings, for which I'm more mostly known, and wove it all together into one person. And that's never been done before. And it was just so heartwarming. It brought tears to my eyes, um, especially the part when he, when he just tied in my um, landscape paintings into this whole everything else that this exhibition is about. Well, I, I agree. I was completely um, thrilled when we got the essay. I think there was one typo in it. It was just perfect when we received it. He's, he's golden, yes. really, he, really. Yes. So on the outside of the gallery, there's, there's a small wall, and we used it as an, an introduction for Phyllis's work and hung up a number of her flyers for her landscape paintings from Sturm Galleries to give you an idea, to give the viewer an idea who's not familiar with her work, um, what else you do? So you want to talk about these? <laughs> oh my gosh, well this is my, this is the main body of my work, which is painting the American West. And I live in Lake Tahoe, so I paint um, high altitude, but I also come down into Nevada and um, I did a show at Stremel just on Nevada landscapes as well one time. And what Chris was saying was that there is no figures in my landscapes. And he said that he felt that it would actually diminish their power. And that really was um, nice to hear. Because I think about it sometimes, the most I've done is put um, some birds in. But I just don't want any man-made structures. I think it's the rhythm and the energy and something that I get personally, because I, I do schlep my stuff out there and start these things on location because I love being outdoors. I love that kind of um, specific information that I get from working plein air. Um, but then I obviously am 
tweaking them and twisting them and doing a little bit of um, stylizing in order to tell the story that I'm trying to tell with the landscape. So you don't complete them fully outside. You no, I don't. You take them to the studio to yes. finish. Yes. So um, I remember when you did a talk for us one time and you talked about a, a flower you had in the foreground and you referred to it as yourself. That yeah, I think, well, I don't know, maybe all art is really um, a self-portrait in some ways, but for me, um, having a sort of a main character, and here I did a series of paintings where I took, took a flower and made it go up into the sky, and that somehow felt as if I'm talking about myself and my relationship to the world. Yeah. Not that I care that anyone gets that, <laughs> but that's my, that was my pathway into that particular painting. It's beautiful. So um, all of Phyllis's ex figure drawings will be in the exhibition until April 20th, and all of them are for sale as a fundraiser for CCAI, and they are $250 each. And we really appreciate Phyllis sharing the sale with us. We're most grateful. Um, we also want to, as we've mentioned, Chris Lanier wrote the essay. Thank you to Chris. And Crystal Passink, our assistant director, is doing the video right now behind the camera. And thank you to Crystal. And thank you to Western Nevada College for collaborating with CCAI <clears throat> so we could use the gallery. We appreciate that very, very much. And also thank you to CCAI's funders and members. And you can learn more about CCAI at ccainv.org. Thank you, Phyllis. <laughs> thank, thank you, you very, very much. Uh, and as far as I can tell, you guys are amazing. You just keep bringing great exhibitions to this well, area. So um, I hope everyone will come and see the show and think about buying one of these drawings as a fundraiser for CCAI. So thank you. Thank you. And if you're interested in seeing any more of my work, uh, please go to my website, phyllisschafer.com. I'm also in the middle of preparing for um, an exhibition at the Lilly Museum on the UNR campus in Reno, Nevada. And that will be happening next October, October 2022.